bring you that top story on the two residents of Ashanti region town of Jiduaku killed in what is believed to be a reprisal attack by nomadic headsmen. There's uh, yet another story, this time some good news, where local farmers at Ogogo in the Ashanti region are excited about progress made in the eviction of nomadic headsmen and their cattle from the area. At least 60,000 cattle owned by both indigents and aliens have already left the operational zone two weeks into the work of Operation Kaleg. The farmers say for the first time in a while, people, especially women, can go to farm without escort. Wahim Interior, whose Balan Shepherd's documentary on the herdsmen and cattlemen has prompted a national response, returned to the area to assess the situation. Here is his report. Cattle owners at Agogo are complying with the eviction order to move their animals out of the area following deployment of a police military team. They say they have no option but to leave under the current circumstances following attack on security personnel, allegedly by herdsmen, resulting in loss of lives. So if you need any medical attention... The police military team at Agogo says it is on course to moving all herdsmen and their cattle from the area. A decision by the Asante Achim North District Assembly to include cattle belonging to local farmers in the eviction was upheld by the Ashanti Regional Security Council. Land operation is aided by aerial surveillance with deployment of three helicopters, which gives no hiding place for the herdsmen. Some cattle owners say the only way out for them to evacuate their cattle from Agogo. Inshallah. Inshallah, I have arranged for a truck to cut the cattle from Agogo. My immediate task is to leave Agogo. Once I leave here, I will be safe. I will not send the cattle to Togo, Abidjan, or Burkina. They will continue to be in Ghana, but I want to first leave Agogo. Farmers in nomadic herdsmen invaded areas are happy at the development. They say they can now go to their farms without fear because there are no cattle to disturb them. Nana Kofi Yamua, a former district chief farmer, lives at Bebuso, one of the areas besieged by cattle. He says women in the community can now go to their farms without escorts. <laughs> The presence of the police military team has been phenomenal. It has pushed the herdsmen and their cattle far from us. At first, farmers had to go to farms in groups, but the situation has changed. Women can now go to the farm without the company of their male counterparts. Chief Superintendent Prince Jude Kobina is the head of Operation Cowlick team. He describes the ongoing operations of the team as successful. Absolutely successful because we follow up each day after we cleared them from where we initially saw them. And our intelligence men on the ground with the interaction of the various opinion leaders and the inhabitants attest to the fact that things have gone down well with them. Despite the success it chucked so far, there are about 40,000 cattle left to be pushed out of Agogo. District Chief Executive Francis Otibuatin, however, vows no single cow will be left in Agogo. To remove those animals or those cattle in the bush and we leave these ones in, definitely I realized that we realized that they were even taking some of those uh, animals in the bush to their cars, and that was also not acceptable. When we say total, if the word is total evacuation of cattle. From Agogo in the Asante Achim North District in the Ashanti region for Joy News, Ohim Interior reporting. So there is excitement in Agogo, but that is not the case for uh, residents of Jiduakonia in Sutan the Setre, central district of the Ashanti region, where two of the natives were among a group of people on a mission to chase our nomadic headsmen, and they have been shot dead. The two 60 year old Kofi Owusu and 75 year old Kweku Aniboye were shot multiple times from AK 47 wielding 
nomadic herdsmen who are in transit from Agogo. The incident is believed to be a, a reprisal of an early attack by residents on cattle belonging to the nomads. My colleague Ohimi Terrier has been to the bushes of Jeriako and has now joined me on the line now where he says from Jeriako the residents are uh, living in fear. Hello uh, Ohimi, what more can you tell us about uh, this incident where two of the natives were shot dead? Thank you, uh, Israel. The incident happened yesterday when residents of Jibiako uh, asking on what they say a mission to flee the area of nomadic men and their cattle uh, went to the bushes armed with uh, machetes in an attempt to chase out uh, these nomadic men. And in the process, they managed to kill seven cattle belonging to the nomadic men. So whilst in the bush, there were 20 men on this particular mission. The hair's men had already laid ambush, and they fired sporadically at the residents, and some of them had to run for their lives. So it was at this point that two uh, uh, men, uh, 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 a new boy, uh, uh, 75, and Kofi Owusu, uh, 60, were killed in the process. And later, when the Insita District uh, Police uh, Commander, uh, D.S.C. Staff Etia, uh, led his men to the bushes uh, today to retrieve uh, the bodies, they combed the bushes and found hand cartridges of AK-47 assault rifles. So the belief is that uh, the herdsmen were armed with AK-47 assault rifles. So the bodies of the two have been deposited at the Mampong uh, Government Hospital pending autopsy. But in this regard, uh, the residents are not happy because they say that earlier on their farms uh, were being destroyed by the herdsmen. So when they saw this large uh, cattle and herdsmen who are on transit from Agubu, uh, they have been using that particular stress uh, to Atebubu, Amantin, Ejira, and these uh, surrounding uh, 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 communities. So they thought that uh, the, rest, uh, the cattle and the herdsmen were there to stay. And that is how come uh, they went ahead with this particular operation. But unfortunately, it's not been successful. It's been yeah. largely for both the herdsmen and the residents. Oh, hearing just by way of recap, uh, from what you're telling me, it sounds like an operation, a, a, a civilian led operation, car leg, that went wrong. Yes, that is the situation. Don't forget, Israel, when we uh, came out first with the violent shepherd documentary, almost every security expert had warned and predicted that a time will come that civilians will put the law into their own hands uh, to protect their land. And that is what will lead to bloodshed. And this is what we have been experiencing at Jediakon. Uh, don't forget that uh, apart from Jediakon, there are other communities where these cattle uh, and their herdsmen had settled. For instance, in Asai Krum, number one, number two, and also in Kujua, they, they were there in their numbers when uh, we went there last week. But for now, they have left after the police team when they and at a point were chased by the castle. So it's an operation called led by civilians that has gone wrong. In this time, they are the ones uh, are the losing end. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ohiming Tia, with that update. But we're staying with the issue. A human rights group known as Arise for the Rights of Fulanese in Ghana or Afrofake is demanding government to adopt a diplomatic way of dealing with a misunderstanding between Fulanese and the farmers at Agogo in the Ashanti region. Among other things, the group is asking government to stop the evacuation of herdsmen in that area and call the aggrieved parties to a, a mediation table. At the news briefing at Bogatanga in the Upper East Region Thursday, coordinator for Afrofig, Ibrahim Barry Diallo, said the mistakes of a few Fulani herdsmen should not warrant a general stereotyping of the entire Fulani people, adding that they will be forced to head to court if government fails to heed to their demands within the next 20 days. Surprisingly, in Ghana, the Fulani's human rights are abused almost every hour. And it's almost as if they do not have rights at all. More so, whenever there is a crime, almost everybody points fingers at them. And the most unfortunate thing is that the media is the leading advocates in this unfortunate stereotype. When the cattle of these planets mistakenly graze in the farm, the cattle are mostly shot dead or the herdsmen killed. But the police are reluctant to make any arrest 
Afrofreak wants to make it clear that most of these headsmen are Ghanaians. And when a single Fulani man or woman commits a crime, the whole ethnic group suffers the consequences. The recent unfortunate still happenings in Abogu of the Asante region of Ghana is unacceptable. The position of the government and the utterance of the member of parliament of Abogu to evict at all costs and means the headsmen and declaration of war is a violation of their human rights. In any case, is the authorities in Abogu saying that citizens of Abogu do not own cattle? Is the government saying that all the headsmen are not citizens of this country and that protecting their business and life is not government business? The Fulanis are discriminated against in the hospitals, schools, public transport, police officers, and at the country's borders by the immigration service officers, officers who intimidate and extort monies from them. The gross disrespect and serious human rights abuses cannot be allowed to flourish in Ghana. We want you to join us when we're taking a break now, but still hiding the bulletin. Ten people fear dead in a road accident at Tichemante in the eastern region after a huge truck loaded with full stuff crashed into a VIP passenger bus heading to Kumasi. Also in the bulletin, police arrest two fugitives who escaped from the Kwabanya police station over the weekend, as well as two of the accomplices who aided the attack in which one police officer was killed. Since arrested two of the fugitives on Tuesday, 23rd January at Raura in the Volta region. They are Atakwejo and Prince of Say. We'll be back with all that and more stations. Now, 10 people are feared dead in a road accident at Teacher Mante in the East Sing Bridging after a huge truck loaded with foodstuff crashed into a VIP passenger bus heading to Kumasi in the Ashanti region. Eyewitnesses say the truck from Kumasi heading to Accra suddenly developed faulty brakes and crashed into the VIP bus. An unknown number of passengers sustained different degrees of injuries and have been rushed to the one hospital for medical attention. Eyewitness Jesse Amankwa joins me over the telephone with more on this. Uh, good evening to you, Jesse. What more can you tell us about this accident? Yeah, it's right. Um, the accident happened around 5.30 this evening, whereby a cargo car loaded with food stuff with a registration number GT1624 F. This is coming from um, Kumase going to Akra, whereby a VIP bus with a registration number E D two three nine three ten. Being also coming from Accra, heading towards Kumasi. And according to um, the draft board, they said the truck loading with uh, the food stuff have a brake failure, whereby it ran into the VIP bus. According to them, they have um, ten. Dead, whereby the body have been sent to the interhome uh, mortuary. Eight, uh, sorry, four in a serious injury. They are also at um, interhome government hospital. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jesse. I, I believe uh, we just have to end that story. But it's quite unfortunate uh, the deaths recorded in that accident. Uh, that was Jesse Amankwa bringing us that update. We're moving on to other stories. Police have arrested two of the seven suspects who broke jail at the Kwabinya police station on Sunday, January 21. The two, Ata Kwejo and Prince Ose, were arrested in the Volta region town of Rara on Tuesday. The Inspector General of Police, David Asante Fiatu, at a media briefing at the police headquarters Thursday afternoon also announced the arrest of two accomplices in the attack on the police station, which resulted in the killing of a police inspector, Emmanuel Ashilevi. Latif Idris was there for joining us. On the 21st of January this year, 
armed men stormed the Kwabena police station, shot and killed an inspector who was on routine checks at the station at the time. The armed men successfully broke out seven suspects who were being held there for armed robbery and possession of arms without license. The arrest, as announced by the IGP, marks the first breakthrough in the manhunt of the fugitive. We have since arrested two of the fugitives on Tuesday, 23rd January, at Raura in the Volta region. They are at Takwejo and Prince Osei. The IGP also announced the arrest of some persons, including a woman who aided the escape of the fugitive. These include a 28-year-old woman named Nancy Benta, alias Irama. The other is George Yabua Aka, a.k.a. Kwesi Shawa. One more person, Kofi Achampon, alias Nana Uwu, age 32, was also arrested yesterday at Apienya. Kofi Achampon is believed to be the spiritual father of the suspects and a source of weapon supply to the criminals. Cortic items such as a coffin and skeletons were found at the place of arrest. What we knew from the start of this jailbreak had to do with the fact that the police didn't have the photograph of one of the seven who broke out of jail. Now, today the police is telling us that they still do not have the photograph of the seven suspects. We are looking for seven people, except that we do not have the photograph that was not published. And we, we need a picture of the seven suspects to help the public to help with investigations. Yes, it is not always the case that you need a photograph in order to arrest somebody. If I mention your name and I give your address, your age, I'm sure somebody can recognize you. It, is, it may not be as easy as having the photograph, but that does not stop us from getting to who we are looking for. Five other suspects, Dixon Ofori, Chibu Zakwaba, Roxin Eden, Kufi Dako, and Emmanuel Kote are still on the run, and the police are calling on members of the public to help with information leading to the arrest. A reward of 15,000 Ghana cities await persons who would give credible information leading to the arrest of the suspect. All right, so I'm just going to quickly take you through the two of those who have been arrested or re-arrested, the fugitives that the police say uh, have been arrested. They are Atakwejo and uh, Prince Sose. So they're just going to come up on the screen right now. So that's... Uh, Ata Kwejo, one of those who has been re-arrested, one of the fugitives re-arrested. And then the other is Prince Sose, who has also been re-arrested. Now, there are five more. Of the five, we have four photos. In fact, the police have only four photos to show. So we're going to look at the four. There is... Uh, so there's uh, Dixon Ofori. And the police have given us some a bit more detail about uh, Dixon Ofori. Uh, Dixon Ofori, his hometown is uh, Bogre near Jasikan. He is said to be smallish and dark in complexion, height five foot five inches tall. He was last seen in Rasta Hair. Uh, let's uh, pull up the Dixon Ofori. All right. Uh, these wouldn't be, we'll just uh, clarify and uh, bring you the, the others. Then there's uh, Chibuzo uh, Akuba. Chibuzo Akuba. The photo we have of Ch Chibuzo Ak Akuza is him lying in a hospital bed. And uh, he's from Anambra State, Nigeria. He's fair in complexion. Uh, he's five foot six inches tall. He has a tattoo of a tiger head on the left shoulder, and which is what you can see there right now and a uh, surgical stitch on the abdomen tribal marks on both cheeks he lives on the legs apparently this is the information that the police is giving to us and the location of arrest was the atomic gate filling station uh, we will bring you uh, some more of the images as we have them later on but staying with the police news conference 
addressed by the IGP. The police chief also spoke about arrests made in connection with last year's fatal shooting in broad daylight of Constable Daniel Owusu at Abekanla Pass. In another development, five persons have been arrested in connection with the murder of Constable Daniel Owusu, who was shot dead by armed robbers at La Paz in Accra on the 13th July 2017 while he was performing patrol duty. They are Benjamin Nee Lamte Flezi, boy, age 27, Kasim Munkaila, alias Ikwe, age 30 years, Laila Mohammed, age 20 years, Musa Ibrahim, alias Moses Kandu, age 37, and Abbas Abdullah, age 36. Kasim Munkaila, and alias Epe, and Musa Ibrahim, alias Moses Kandu, were the suspects who shot Constable Daniel Owusu, but went into hiding immediately after the incident, until recently when they were arrested. I take this opportunity to once again assure the good people of Ghana and the international community to remain calm and support the Ghana police. Right, so that was uh, the IGP addressing a news conference earlier today. Now let's go back to the rest of the fugitives that the police are still looking out for. Uh, we have the images now, we're going to be sharing them with you in a bit. So this is uh, Kofi Dako, who the police is also looking for. Kofi Dako is from Asante Achim, according to the information given us by the police. He's dark in complexion, height 5 foot 7 inches, uh, medium built in stature, and he was arrested at Kwabenya runabout. Uh, Chibuzo, who I have talked about earlier, he has a tattoo on the hand. Prince Jose, uh, he was he has been rearrested. And then Dixon Ofori is the other suspect who the police is looking out for. He uh, his hometown is Bodre near Jasekang. He is smallish and dark in complexion, height five foot five inches tall. He was last seen in Rasta here. And then Adam Roxing. Adam Roxing, he's from Pando in the Volta region. He's fair in complexion, slim in stature, height five foot seven inches. And uh, he's often seen smiling. That's what the police told us, except he's not exactly smiling in this photo. Attack Kojo has been rearrested. The other image or the image of the final uh, gentleman who is being wanted, the police themselves do not have his image, and so we can share that with you. Now, in some other news, some defense lawyers in the trial of former top executives of the National Communications Authority are demanding that an Accra High Court hold hearing of the case. Former NCA board chairman Eugene Bafuboni and four others have been charged with causing financial loss to the state and have since December been before the court. Their lawyers on Thursday requested that the Attorney General furnish them with a list of all witnesses to appear before the court, a request the AG was unwilling to honor. They therefore urged the court to halt the trial, insisting the Supreme Court be allowed to make a pronouncement on whether their request is permitted under law. Trial Judge Justice Che Bafo adjourned hearing to February 1 to deliver his ruling on the request for the list of witnesses. There is more in the following report. Godwin Tamaklo, who is a member of the team representing the former Deputy National Coordinator, Alaji Mimina Osman, told the court allowing them access to a list of witnesses will ensure a fair trial. Relying on Article 19.2 of the 1992 Constitution, he argued that his client was entitled to all facilities that will enable him to put up his defense. He stated, quote, how can a man prepare his defense if he is blindfolded, unquote. A similar motion was also moved by lawyer for businessman George Derek Opon, who is also before the court. The former NCA board chair's legal team, led by Thaddeus Sorry, also served notice of moving the application in writing. Counsel for former NCA board member Nano Usu and Sao also asked to be allowed to do the same. The Attorney General Gloria Kuku opposed the application. Chief State Attorney Evelyn Kilson argued on her behalf. 
She said the rules governing a summary trial such as this does not allow such requests to be made. She urged the court to turn down a request for a halt of proceedings because the constitutional provision did not require interpretation. Trial Judge Justice Che Bafu adjourned proceedings to February 1, 2018 to deliver his ruling. We're taking a break to bring you business news here on Joy News Prime, but still ahead, Control and Accounting General's Department faults Trade Ministry's use of official bank accounts for the collection of cash for seed proceeds. Stay tuned, we'll be back in a bit. Licensing of LPG marketing companies to be absorbed into the new production and distribution module introduced by government has begun. The Association of LPG Marketers has so far expressed satisfaction with the involvement uh, of its members in the cylinder recirculation model. That Karen Dodu has been speaking with public relations officer of the association and has more in the following report. The LPG Marketers Association, which previously fell sidelined in the implementation of the new model, is now satisfied with the leveled involvement in the process of implementation of the recirculation model. After negotiations with government, it finally accepted the implementation of the model under some mutually acceptable conditions. Spokesperson for the association, Bernardo Redu, explains that there is a fair representation of membership of the association. Uh, as we speak, the members of the association are represented on the implementation committee, which is tasked with seeing to implementing the new LPG policy. We have our members on that committee, and um, they are working together with representatives from the National Petroleum Authority, uh, the Ministry of Energy, I think Ghana Standard Authority, the Fire Service, uh, the Factories Inspectorate Division, and other stakeholders working together to bring out a licensing framework or regime for the implementation of the new policy. So as far as we are concerned, we are much in the know of the happenings and workings of the implementation committee. And some of our members are also on the subcommittee license, uh, 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 licensing, uh, subcommittee for licensing. Licensing of companies that would be involved in the bottling and distribution chain of liquefied petroleum gas has already begun, pending takeoff in August. Bernardo Redu says there are indications the licensing process will happen in phases. We are hearing from our members who are on the committee, especially the um, subcommittee on licensing, is that work has started and as we speak, they had finished a uh, deliberation on um, a category of the license. They would have to work on the different uh, 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 players along the value chain. So that is what they are working on. So we are being informed by the members of the association on the committee, and we are really in the know of what is happening there. Under the first phase, some LPG storage companies are said to have been given licensing to be followed by others in the value chain. Senior country partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers, Vish Ashagbo, has been giving us some insight on what is pushing some international business giants into the country, including JP Morgan Chase & Co. and international oil and gas company ExxonMobil to Ghana. Sources say the Bank of Ghana has indicated its preparedness to consider the request from one of the world's biggest banks, JP Morgan Chase & Company, to establish its presence in Ghana. Vish Ashagbo says... This is an indication of business confidence in the economy. Organizations of that nature do not easily uh, or do not set up business in a country, like you said, without doing their homework. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a sign of confidence mm -hmm. uh, in our economy. Uh, they are seeing something uh, that um, we should also see um, as, uh, as, uh, as locals and take advantage of the same promise that they are seeing. I mean, we've been in this business for a very long time. And when I sit at the table with those big giants, I mean, uh, shivers through my spine. I mean, what should be our oh. approach? <laughs> As me personally, if I'm negotiating for a country like maybe Togo, and I have to be at the table with maybe JP Morgan's and Exxon, what should be our position to ensure that we get what we're supposed to get as a country and not be uh, affected by the might and power of these giants? Well, um, I don't think there's any particular magic to it. It's like any other uh, meeting or negotiation that you go to. You must be prepared mm -hmm. and you must understand what is in it for you, what is in it for the other side, and be prepared to negotiate uh, as hard as you can to, to make it a win-win, ultimately. 
Um, so there's no magic to it. I think it's just about preparation, uh, understanding uh, the landscape, understanding uh, your own potential, understanding the other person's offer or potential, and trying to uh, strike a win-win. Now, some industry players continue to raise concerns over the continuous implementation of the tax stamp policy by government. The Food and Beverage Association is warning the policy, which took effect on January 1, will collapse local beverage camp manufacturing firms in the country. General Secretary of the Association, Samuel Agri, made this known at the launch of the Ghana Beverage Awards in Accra. Here's more in this report. Ghana's local beverage industry faces a threat of collapse should the government not reconsider the tax stamp policy. This is what the General Secretary of the Food and Beverage Association, Sam Agri, is asserting, saying the policy seeks to jeopardize manufacturing companies across the country. Speaking to Joy Business on the sidelines of the launch of the Ghana Beverage Awards, Sam Agri argued that exempting local manufacturing firms from the tax stamp policy could help expand the industry. But I don't think any serious country would want to introduce the measures that have been put into those laws. Because once you put those... Uh, 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 you start to criminalize businesses, then what you are doing is that you are asking industry to fold up and then relocate to other uh, countries. This is not what we want. So you think this also has the potential of collapsing local beverage manufacturing? What it means is that those who are not able to implement the tax stamp policy, you eventually will have to fold up. On his part, tax expert KB Anda called for broader consultation between government and local manufacturers over the policy. The other day is about dialogue. The government is looking for ways and means to increase revenue. Any revenue shortfall means that the country is sick. And any astute minister will look around and see how best he or she can garner more revenue. Once this economy is self-financing, and remember, the president is quick to indicate that Ghana should go beyond aid. It falls into that, you know, philosophy. We need to be self-financing. Meanwhile, acting chief executive of the Ghana Tourism Authority, Akwesi Ajeman, has assured the authority will prioritize industry research and create ready markets for local manufacturing industries. I want to see a certain amount of improvement, so research and development. If you look at most of the drinks that are on the market now, they are herbal based. And so the collaboration between the industry and academia to see how, I mean, some of the herbs that are used, because they have some medicinal benefits and we are not marketing it well. And so if we can improve on that medicinal uh, value of most of the drinks that we have, then I believe that it will be the best thing. Africa. The Ghana Beverage Award is expected to take place in August. Turning to agriculture, some farmers who took part in the Planting for Food and Jobs program are praising government for the increased yields and productivity levels so far. According to them, the improved seeds and subsidizing of fertilizers have helped to almost double their yields. They are, however, raising concerns about the four army worm invasion of their farms, as well as the lack of tractor services for their work. Government introduced the program as an avenue to modernize agriculture and make it as a source of employment for the teeming youth. The farmers made the disclosure in an interaction with Deputy Minister for Food and Agriculture in charge of horticulture, George Wahing Udu, in the Upper West Regional Capital, WA. Planting for Food and Job program was introduced by the government to help address the declining growth of the country's agriculture sector. It is a five year long program which is geared towards increasing food productivity and ensures food security for the country, as well as reduces food import bills to the barest minimum. However, the implementation of the program was fraught with myriad of challenges, including the invasion of maize farms by the fall army worm. That notwithstanding, majority of the maize farmers in the country were still able to at least double their production. The Deputy Minister for Food and Agriculture in charge of horticulture, George Boyne Odro visited some farmers to listen to them about their success and challenges faced in the implementation of the program. Alhaji Antiku Abdullahi of Antika Farms is a farmer and also into the production of improved seeds. He has cultivated about 1,000 acres of maize and has gotten 15,000 bags of maize. He owns this warehouse. So it helps us to increase 
the years as compared to the previous years. I'm saying this because the previous years, most farmers get averagely between five bags per acre, but this year, the average yield per acre is um, 15 bags per acre. And that's all we have for you by way of business tonight. For more business news, log on to myjournline.com slash business. My name is Manuel Apuachi Jaffe. There's more news ahead. Good evening. <laughs>
So following the hearing today, the uh, uh, Public Accounts Committee of Parliament submitted its report on that particular session to the House for approval. And there weren't any firm recommendations in terms of sanctions. In fact, the main ones were that the committee was recommending that the auctioneer, Alexander J, should be referred to the auctioneer's association so that then his license is revoked and that uh, government should make efforts to recover some of the sums. He was supposed to have taken only 3% of the commission, uh, you know, 3% commission on the money that accrued, but he took 7%. They've been asked to recover the rest. And um, even for the uh, ministry officials who the committee noted had breached the Public Financial Management Act, there weren't any specific sanctions that were recommended against them. And MPs were not happy, both the majority and the minority side. We can even, uh, we can in fact listen to Emmanuel Bejra, who is the NDC MP for uh, Whole West, and the majority leader of State Chairman Sabonso. Right. Comment did not tell this house that when you breach a law, the sanctions that have been prescribed by those laws should be applied. But it came out to tell us that the, the parties who have breached the law should be sanctioned. I don't think that is a good thing, Mr. Speaker. Whatever action that needs to be taken should be taken in accordance with our own law that has been breached, which was passed by this house. What do we do to these people so that these infractions on our laws we cannot continue, you know, passing laws in this house, and the laws will just be, you know, you just abuse the law, or you just decide that you do things your your own way. We cannot continue like that. What kind of country are we? Are we governing? If we really want to do the right thing, then this house must be respected. If the law is passed by this house, it must be respected. That regard, Mr. Speaker, recognizing that. The report falls short in many areas of their own representation. Mr. Speaker, I would say that we send this report back to the committee. There are very good materials in the committee, and I believe if they do a second, a second reading of their own report and do serious introspection, they will come to us in a better way, with better recommendations, which we will adopt it. But now, Speaker, if we leave it to plenary, if we leave it to plenary, plenary may come with various suggestions and it, become, it may become difficult to synthesize those recommendations for plenary. So let us take the report back to the committee for them to have a second look at it to properly guide this house into taking a very good decision. Right, so that was the position of the majority and minority sides of the House. Now, the first Deputy Speaker of Parliament who was presiding or sitting directed the committee to go and rework the report. All these matters have been covered. We think that that is not sufficient. Some breaches of the law have occurred. We must, the recommendation must be made in respect of them. Some public officials were negligent or non-compliance of the law. Some recommendations in respect of those. That is why we are, I'm directing that the report comes back to the committee. All that is outstanding. The committee should do that and report that. I'm not putting the question on the report. The decision on the report will be deferred. And so I direct that the report goes back to the committee to um, recommend um, other, other recommendations which we think are amenable from the report. The report have made observations, but the conclusions are not sufficient. So I direct that the committee take the report back and make the appropriate recommendations. Now, caught between the devil and the deep blue sea, that best describes the current situation of a 32-year-old mother who is accusing her own husband of defiling their six-year-old daughter. The mother of the girl says she had suspected the father for a long time, but her suspicions were confirmed two years ago when she caught her, then four-year-old girl, standing naked in front of her father, with him inserting his finger into her vagina. The latest incident happened two weeks ago when the girl confessed to her mother that her father put her in a couch and inserted his fingers in a private part. Mother of a girl is however scared any action against her husband can lead to
to a withdrawal of support from Little Girl. Maxwell Agroban has more on this report. Mother of the victim reported with the child at the Children's Hospital in Accra after the latest incident two weeks ago. Medical personnel there examined the girl and later referred her to the Kolibu Teaching Hospital for further treatment. Medical report intercepted by Joy News from the Child Health Department of the Kolibu Teaching Hospital confirms that the victim has been defiled. The six-year-old girl has also developed a urinary tract infection with an offensive vaginal discharge. The mother of the victim has been narrating to me how she has on numerous occasions confronted her husband about the issue. <laughs> He started doing that to our child for a very long time. She usually tells me, anytime she informs me about it, I confront her father, but he denies it all the time. I later caught him red-handed. My daughter had raised her dress, and he was inserting his fingers in her genitals. He took his phone and started pressing it immediately he realized I had seen him. The second one was recent. I went out on a short errand. When I returned, the gate had been I banged the door for several times. He later asked my daughter to open the door for me. When I went inside and confronted why they had locked the door, my daughter was unable to speak. But shortly after her dad left, she opened up to me. She narrated how her dad put her on a chair and inserted his fingers in her genitals. Mother of the six-year-old girl fears any action against the man can result in the withdrawal of his support for the little girl. I am scared if I go and report, I would have problems afterwards. That's why I did not report it. We have quarreled over the issue many times. When I inform my family members, they do nothing to save the situation. Some of my family members tell me to forget the issue. Otherwise, he will develop negative thoughts for me. The 32 year old trader is depressed about the situation. For Joy News, Maxwell Ababa. Now, the Minister of Gender, Children and Social Protection, Otuka Fisa Java, has described as a national security issue the recent rampant reports of child defilement. She says her ministry is collaborating with the security agencies to deal with perpetrators. She was speaking with Joy News' parliamentary correspondent, Joseph Opokugako. It's a national security issue, uh, these uh, gang rapes. That's what I mean. These are bullies, cowards, who are insecure that they would find men raping one single young girl. I mean, what is it? People are not happy. That is why they are agitating. It's because we expect more from our teachers. The teacher is the carer in the absence of the parent. And so a parent is not supposed to sleep with their child. And anybody under the age of 18 should not be slept with. Actually, there are ethics in the workplace where colleagues are not supposed to have um, sexual relationships because it affects the best interest of the organization. But in the area of children, it is a complete no-go area because the child is to be protected by the adults. So if the adults are molesting the children, that means it's irresponsible of the adults. Any form of abuse against any child smacks of irresponsibility, of your lack of courage, your lack of self-dignity. If you had any pride in yourself, you wouldn't sleep with your child. But in Africa, your neighbor's child is your child. We are a community of Ghanaians. So we shouldn't be doing that. And I would want to ask that parents should teach their children about safe touching and unsafe touching. Because the child doesn't know that you're not supposed to do something like that, touch their private parts. So parents must stop being shy and talk to their children. 
for the minute that a child can talk and walk, we must begin to let them understand their rights. And to protect the child, they must know that uncle must not touch them in a certain way. A father must not touch a child in a certain way. A stepfather is a father. They shouldn't be doing those things. In another development, Deputy Minister for Education, Barbara Asha AEC, says the headmaster of a Duman DAJHS, Robert Sepe, who recorded himself having sex with a senior high school student, will face stern disciplinary action. This is despite the Ghana National Association of Teachers' statement saying the headmaster has done no wrong since the student is a consenting adult and he, the headmaster, did not circulate the video. Mrs. Asha AEC, however, says Sepe's image as a head teacher has been tarnished and it will be difficult for him to carry out his duties. She also outlines plans by her ministry to check sexual abuse and harassment in schools. You know, the, the, the image, I mean, as a head teacher and the image even out there on the social media, I don't think he would even be comfortable to even, you know, probably get to the classroom. I don't think, excuse me to say, anybody who had gone through such an encounter or an experience would even be bold enough to go to the, to the classroom. So we shouldn't try to find excuses because in the minds of people, we're still thinking that it was a, a student you know, a teacher, you know, relationship, which we do not encourage, you know, teacher, student relationship, we do not encourage. So it doesn't matter your age. Somebody can be 20 and still be in school. But whilst we're in school, you are still, you know, a student. But this, she's not his student. She's in another school, at senior high school. She's graduated from the school he was a teacher in. And they're having the, the Ghana National Association of Teachers not has released a statement, for instance, saying that the man has done no wrong. You still want to see him punished? Well, not even if it's not by GES, even if it's not by GES, I think that the, the, the reputation it makes it a little bit complex, like you were saying. If the, the girl is still a student anyway, so it doesn't matter if the girl is your student or not. But I do think that looking at the, the, the issue, the teacher himself will be comfortable even going back to teach. It's a very, I believe that it's a very serious, and I, 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 I sympathize or I empathize with, with the teacher because you are thinking that you're having probably a relationship and the child is not, the girl is not your student and the girl is 18. You understand? So the, the law doesn't frown on somebody who is 18 years and they're still engaging. But I don't think it's also healthy, most especially if it was private, that's fine. But in the, in the you know, public domain, it makes it a little bit complex and difficult. Now, vehicle owners in the country may soon have no choice but to purchase first aid kits for their vehicles from the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Authority. That is, if the authority decides that it is the way to go. Chief Executive of the DVLA, Kwesi Ajimambuzia, who disclosed this, said the authority is considering it and may soon reintroduce it. Earlier this month, the DVLA withdrew its mandatory first aid kit policy following protests by motorists who described it as unfair. Whilst admitting the authority did not do a good job in creating awareness about the policy, DVLA Chief Executive Kwesi Ajimambuzia says it is not entirely off the table. Good question. The uh, the first aid kit, the concept of it, um, is, a, is a good concept. It's in the law. It's already been socialized in the community. We did a very poor job. We botched up the process of implementation. There's no doubt about that. Um, but as you know, as His Excellency is working towards a better, robust in, uh, ambulance system for the country, the law that has been in the books for a while, has always been there for five years or so, was to make sure that uh, vehicles and trailers and so forth had a first aid kit. The time lapse between when an accident, an unfortunate accident occurs, and the time somebody receives aid, that time sometimes is very critical to get something that would uh, save lives, if you will. Um, so the concept is noble. Um, the regret that you refer to, which is a regret, um, is that we had an opportunity to implement this, saving lives, which is part of what we are here to do, and we did a poor job in implementing it. So that's a regret, and we are looking at it now with the board. Everything we do goes through the board and we're collaborating with the ministry. So that wasn't well handled, and we are looking to do a better job at it.
So is it possible that the first aid kit may come back so that people can assess it? Yes, it's in the books, and it is likely it would come back, but we have to do a better job of educating the public about it. Mm. We have to look at all the, the, the pieces of the puzzle and how we can put it together. And timeliness is also important because as we talk, as we speak, as we work hard to control the uncertified driver, the untested vehicle, and saving lives, we need to make sure it's also done uh, in a fashion where uh, if we let a long time lapse, we may be losing some of our, our loved ones, but it has to be done right. Now, perhaps a major challenge facing the DVLA is the role of Goro boys who act as middlemen for motorists seeking driver's licenses, roadworthy certificates, and registration of their vehicles. Well, they have a lawyer and they are demanding the operations are formalized. Mr. Jumang Buzia said the issue is being considered. Yes, it has. Um, it, it's, it's an organized community. Um, they've written to me through their lawyer. <laughs> Uh, with the desire of their activities being regularized. Uh, we've looked at it. Um, we're still even looking into that situation. And what's the basis uh, for this, you know, <laughs> legal representation to get you to go to their demands? Well, I think uh, several, and uh, the, that question is best answered by them. But I think they presented the fact that they organized, they have numbers, and um, when they felt the heat, in my opinion, of the changes we're bringing, they needed to find a way to survive. And one of the ways I think they came up with, let's talk to the authority that's mandated by law and see if there's a way they could move from the side street to the main street. I think at the ports, something effectively was done that way. But we're a different entity in that regard. And so the idea of taking them en bloc, and the numbers are significant, um, and, and bringing them online where they can do legitimate work it's not uh, a very easy thing to, to come to conclusion with. So we're, we're, we're dealing with that aspect. But the fact remains that there's, there's a group out there, they are organized, and they even have legal representation. While well, officials of the National Security are currently investigating some staff of the authority said to be involved with the trading of software and data for the printing and issuance of vehicle roadworthy certificates said to have cost the nation millions of CDs in revenue leakage. The activities, according to authorities, involve the Goro community, which sells this to unsuspecting vehicle owners. The Juman Buzia says the law will take its course on those involved. And we had to find a way to come up with a more securitized, more robust leveraging technology again. Um, I'm happy to tell you that if you compare with the new one, the numbers of January only for the last two years, 2016, 2017, there's a 360%. January is not over. Mm. We're talking, as of yesterday, 360% revenue generation increment from 17, 2017 to 2018. And the reason being, we are plugging that leakage that was happening, the compromised nature of a national security document that was highly compromised. We are gradually, slowly, steadily plugging the loopholes that compromise that document that made people be, have the ability to duplicate it and put it in the marketplace. It is hard to imagine how much data information that the guru community gets without inside help. Mm -hmm. It's hard to imagine because some of the stuff, the software that they compromised, it had to come from inside. Mm -hmm. We have, and we are, uh, engage national security folks in the process in trying to make sure if they uncover anybody that works for us involved in any activity in collaboration with the Goro community, the law takes its course with them. I don't doubt there is an activity that may be going on or will be, is going on. I don't, I need the evidence. That's why we have national security working with us to uncover these practices. But the threat remains. Now, plastic bottles constitute a significant chunk of the waste problems authorities have to deal with. There's, however, a new building technology which makes use of plastic bottles and sand and which could turn it into a resource rather than the menace that it is at the moment and actually slash building costs fast at it. 
joining us is Justice Vedu, who has been to the Shanti region town of Kantin Chireng, where community members are pioneering what is described as the cost saving technology in our report. Tons and tons of waste, like what you see here, continue to flood many gutters and waterways. Scenes like this is what will greet you in several cities across the country. It's not just a good breeding ground for mosquitoes, but it's also one of the many reasons that cause the occasional flooding that hits the city. Now that is about to change. In the heart of Kumasi, this young man is moving from house to house, picking used plastic bottles. And what they use it for is what makes all the difference. In Kentin Chuen, a small community just outside Kumasi, the villagers here are putting the empty bottles to use, building a structure for their community KVIP. We are serious with this building. We would get a toilet now to help us end open defecation. From this, we can even build our own house. It's a trial building that hopefully will be adopted by others in putting up their own home. Where we are, there's an entrance to the corridor. James Kumsen is the man teaching these villagers the innovation. The plastic bottle is very durable. It's also soundproof and also serves as um, fire resistance. So in case of any fire outbreak, um, the block will go down whereby this one, or the block will flame because heat have a, a certain, certain degree that the block can go. But the bottles also have a certain degree because of the refill it with the sun. When, so in the case of any fire outbreak, the sun can recover the fire outbreak faster than the, the normal blog. Ghana currently has a housing deficit of about 1.7 million, largely due to the high cost of putting up a building. As government grapples with how to address the housing challenge, the people of Kenting Chuen seem to have taken a comfortable lead showing the way on how to build for less. Justice Beidou, Joy News, Kentin Train. Impressive work there. The, um, that this is Joy News Prime. In time now for a quick look at our top story here on Joy News Prime. Police arrest two fugitives who escaped from the Kwabenya police station over the weekend, as well as two of the accomplices who aided the attack in which one officer was killed. Five other suspects have also been arrested in connection with the killing of another police officer at Abekala Pass in July last year. Two residents of Ashanti region town of Jodiako killed in what is believed to be a reprisal attack by nomadic headsmen. Controller and Accountant General Steve Parkman faults trade ministry's use of official bank accounts for the collection of cash for seed proceeds. In business, National Petroleum Authority begins licensing of LPG marketing companies ahead of the takeoff of a new recirculation model of LPG distribution later in the year. And defense lawyers in trial of former top executives of the National Communications Authority demand a halt to the trial over the refusal by the Attorney General to release the full list of witnesses she intends to invite.